This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, good morning everyone. Shalom Aleichem. Baruchem Abam to the Koilel Agar de Pirka Monday afternoon national shir. We're going to speak about a topic relevant to Parshas Boy and Yitzhiz Mitzrayim in general. This is a fundamental idea and subject. And understanding this topic will give us a new appreciation for Sefer Shemais and all the parashiyos of Yitzhiz Mitzrayim. It is a mystical concept, and at the same time a very contemporary and relevant concept. In Parashas Boi, in Parak Yud, Pasuk Chavches to Chavtes, Vayomer Loi Moshe, Moshe says, Vayomer Loi Paroi, Paroi says to Moshe, Leich me'alai, get out of here. He shomer lecha, watch out. Al toisef ro'is panai. Don't look at my face again. Ki b'yom ro'is chafanai, Thomas. The day, the day you see my face, you're going to die. So Paroi warns Moshe. He doesn't want Moshe looking at him again. And what is Moshe Rabbeinu's reaction to that? Moshe Rabbeinu's reaction is, okay, you have the, yeah, you see the Maramakoimos on the side? You got them? Okay. Yes, it's visible, but it's going to make it a little bit bigger, maybe even better. Okay, here's what we're going to do. In my opinion. Here we go. Okay. Good? good. Okay. So, um, Vayomer Moshe, Moshe said, Kein Barta, you're right. <laughs> Good gezakt. I won't see your face again. So it's uh, quite interesting that instead of them fighting over what they should have been fighting over, namely, Paris should be telling Moshe, you ain't taking the Jews out of Egypt. And Moshe would, would, should say, no, you bet I am. I'm going to be taking them all out. They're fighting about whether Moshe can look at Paroi. Paroi said, don't look at me. Moshe said, you're right. I won't look at you again. This is the last chance, the last time. In fact, Rashi adds to this exchange. Rashi says, Kein dibarta, yafe dibarta. You spoke well. Uvizmanu dibarta. And your comments are timely. That's the truth. I'm not going to see your face again. So there are a number of questions over here. Why is the emphasis on Moshe's agreeing with Paroi? Moshe says, Paroi, Yafe di Barta, Bismanoi di Barta. Wow, Paroi is getting like smich over here. Moshe is giving him a very nice compliment. You spoke so nicely. You spoke very timely. It could not have been a, a more uh, effective juncture to, uh, to make your comments. It's very interesting. Well, why, is, why the emphasis on these uh, accolades that Moshe Rabbeinu is showering Pari with? Yafe di Barta, Bismanoi di Barta. And why is Moshe even looking at Pari? Pari said, don't look at me again! So Moshe, okay, fine, you're right. This is the last chance I'm going to look at you. Why was he even looking at him? Why is Moshe gazing at Parai? Another interesting point is that we know that when the Bnei Yisrael were leaving Mitzrayim, they didn't even have a chance for their dough to rise as they were hurried out of Mitzrayim. They could not delay. It says, They baked the dough. They were banished from Egypt. They could not delay. They didn't make provisions. And Chazal tell us, we have a tradition from the Arizal and the Rambam, writes similar words that Klai Yisrael and Mitzrayim fell to a very, very low madrega, and had they remained there even a moment longer, they would have fallen to what is called the point of no return. Now, why is Hashem doing that to them? Why is Hashem keeping them in Mitzrayim that they should sink, 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 and then Hashem has to take them out just in a, just in a split second left? I mean, if somebody has to catch a flight, you know, you don't want to get to the airport, you know, 40 minutes before the flight, and then you have to run, and um, 
not, not this past week, a week before I was in Cleveland. So I got to the airport in Cleveland, a little bit too close for comfort, I don't know, about 50 minutes. And the customs, uh, not the, the, the security was very tight. And it was about 18 minutes till takeoff. And we still hadn't cleared the security. And we finally clear security and we run, we run, we run. I run to the gate and, I, and nobody's getting on the plane. I said, what happened? They said, uh, ah, it was the flight was delayed. Okay, so I figured I still have a few moments. Next thing I hear, Gladstein, the, will the Gladstein party get to your flight? I said, what's going on? I'm right here. No, my gate was switched. So uh, basically the flight was about to take off and we, were, <laughs> we hadn't boarded yet. But you, you, know, you don't want to do that. You want to you wanna get to the airport in time so that you could board comfortably without anxiety, without having to worry. Why is Hashem leaving them into Mitzrayim until like the very last second and then He has to hurry them out and they don't even have time for the bread to rise? And then there's this um, emphasis of that the Bnei Yisrael had to take every last item, every last possession out of the land of Egypt. Why was that so important that they take all their cattle with them, that nothing remains? And then again, when Kali Yisrael get to the Yam, we have this idea that this would be the last time that the Bnei Yisrael could look at Mitzrayim. Then the Pesach says, Ki asher isem, as I'm hayoyim, as you've seen in Egypt today, lo isoy sifu l'ray sam oid adaylam. You will never look at them again. Look at them now. You will never look at them again. Now we know usually the Torah says you're not allowed to return to Mitzrayim, but why? The emphasis you can't look at them, right? There's a whole question whether um, you're a person's allowed to go to Egypt today. You'd be surprised when uh, I was on the flight to Turkey. So we had, a, we had a quite a nice group to Turkey. We had about over 20 people, mostly Hasidim. But the flight was packed with Hasidim. So I, I asked him, Where are, you, are you also going to Turkey? No. He said, where are you going? He said, we're going to Egypt. I said, come on, you're pulling my leg. No. They're going to, I said, what are you going to Egypt? you have business? No, I don't have business. It's Parshas Va'era Boy. What, where, where would anybody want to go? In Parshas Va'era Boy, then Egypt. Every, every year, Parshas Va'era, they go to Egypt. I said, do you dress like this? Yeah, they dress like Hasidim. You're not scared? Very safe over there. So you have people, they go back to Egypt today, but why the emphasis on you're not allowed to look at them? Why the emphasis on the Re'iyah? What's... And then the Pasuk says in Shemois that Hashem tells Bnei Yisrael, V'nitzal temes Mitzrayim, you will literally empty out Mitzrayim. Targum says, V'soy re'kinon, you will empty them out. What does it mean we're going to empty them out? The Balaturim says, V'nitzal temes gematria, kemetsula she'im v'adagim, like a pond that has no fish. We'll really empty them out. Why, why the emphasis on the emptying out of Egypt? Another interesting question. Throughout Shas, we have this phenomenon. You don't want to like irk or raise the ire of Tamide Chachamim because if they give you a bad look, then they could, they could knock a person off. Gemara tells us that Rabbi Yochanan had very long eyelashes and if he would lift up his eyelashes and give a look, you know, the person would die. Or we have an expression in Shas, um, in a number of places, that Rabbi Sheshes, Nasan Boyenov, he put his eye on the person. The Nasa Gal Shalat Samais, and the person became a pile of bones. So, what exactly is this uh, idea that the Tamei Chachamim, we know that Tamei Chachamim Toi V'ayin Hu Yevarach Why, what is this idea that a Tamei Chachamim will look at somebody and they would cause them harm? What is this all about? So let's begin with the great teaching of the Arachayim HaKadosh, Reb Chaim Ibn Atar, who was born in Morocco in 1696. And he was a great tzaddik who was driven from place to place. The Chida writes that his holiness was phenomenal and um, 
his knowledge of the Talmud was awesome, the Chida says, he wrote on Shas, Chefetz Hashem An Halacha, pre Tayar, and after much wandering he settled in Yishlaim in 1743, and he passed away at the age of only 47 years old. It says, Archaim HaKadosh, an idea that Ba'avon Oseinu HaRabim, he writes this in Parshas Bereshis, many sparks of Kedusha, many Nitzoytzois of Kedusha have become, have drowned, have become immersed in the shells, in the klipais. V'gam harbe erev rav nishtaku b'toich ha Many add mixture of impurity mixed in Kedusha. And the, the Arachayim HaKadosh teaches us a great principle. Hine yodua. It is known ki ha-klipa chiyusa hi yini kasem ha Even Tuma, its source of nourishment is a spark of Kedusha. Vizula ze ein lachios. Otherwise, it would have no life force. It would have no life. So there's an idea that everything in this world has a spark of kedusha that is, so to speak, the soul of that item. Even a rasha, even a wicked person, he has to have some spark of kedusha. Otherwise, he cannot exist. That's like his soul. Even something which is tamei has to have a nitzutz of kedusha. Even an inanimate object has to have an in, a nitzutz of kedusha. And when that nitzutz of kedusha is pulled out, that item, that entity, will cease to exist. V'lachein says the Archaim HaKadosh, Behevdiloi Hashem is Ha'ar, when God separates the light, Shehi HaKedusha, V'nishar Hara, Muvdal, and the evil remains separated, V'ein loy makam chios, and it has no life, Linoik mimenu, to nourish from it, Memela Yevatel, Memela it will cease to exist. This is what it means, that's Ruach HaToma Avir Min Ha'aretz. And, the Archaim HaKadosh expands on this idea, and this is a very important idea. Namely, that some, everything in this world is predicated and nourishes from a source of Kedusha, which is its life force. If that uh, spark is ever removed, that entity would no longer is, uh, exist. And the Archaim HaKadosh in Parshas Vayichi, he explains the episode, the narrative, based on what he calls, Achin Yizbaru Haksuvim Alpi Hakdama Achas, I'll explain the Psukim based on one introduction, Zaka Ubara, pure and clear, Asher Heiru Einenu Bidvaram Nechmadim Eir Tarasina, that we've been illuminated with from the light of our Torah. And that is, he says, an idea that Adam Rishon was the tree that all the souls of Kedusha depended and hanged on. From the time that that all the souls would come out to the world until today, all souls that were ever created were hanging upon the tree of Adam Arishon. And when Adam Arishon sinned, the Kaya Chara dominated those souls, Vayiz Mimenu Shevi, and they took captive Shevi. It doesn't mean a car called a Shevi, it means they took captives. Le'in Misbar, they took captive many holy souls. And it is now incumbent upon man to try to release and free these souls and the nation of God from the time that we existed as a people. It is our job to be mavarer and to remove these swallowed, kidnapped souls through and now how do we release them? How do we free these holy souls that have been captured by the dark side? By learning Torah, by doing mitzvot, we're able to uh, relinquish and capture these souls and the Archaim HaKadosh explains many different ways that we're able to relinquish and uh, capture these souls, either by learning Torah and doing mitzvahs like we mentioned. Sometimes Archaim HaKadosh says, when a holy soul clings to a nefesh temea, like in the episode of Dina, when Dina lived with Shechem, so Dina was able to extract, extract from Shechem Many holy souls, and in that instance, she was able to extract from him Rachavas, Rabbi Chanina ben Tradyoin. And sometimes, when Geirim come to convert, they're able to retrieve some of the holy souls. And some notable Geirim that brought back some of these sparks are none other than Avraham Avinu, Sara Imenu, Rus Hamoyavia, Shmaya Avtalion, Unklas Hager, and of course, Rabbi Meir, who also descended from. Um, these Geirim. Now, says Rav Gedal Yashor, based on this idea of the Archaim HaKadosh, 
He said it is from time immemorial, from the time of the sin of Adma Rishon, it is the job, the avoida of the Am Hashem to try to relinquish these sparks of Kedusha that got scattered throughout the world, says Rabbi Gedali Yashor. This is the phenomenon, and this is why Klal Yisrael endures the Golos. And we travel from country to country, and we go to Europe, and the, the Jewish people are scattered throughout the world. We're in Babylon, we're in Persia, we're in Syria, we're in Morocco, we're in Yemen, we're in France, we're in Germany, we're in Great Britain, we're throughout the world, and now we're in the United States of America. Why? Because when Klal Yisrael were on a high enough level, then we could live in Eretz Yisrael, and through the learning of Torah and the performance of mitzvahs, we can attract these sparks of Kedusha like the force of a magnet, Ke'even Shoyeves, like a magnet. But when Klal Yisrael were downgraded in their ability, when our Kayach HaKedusha has been diminished, now we don't have such a magnetic force to pull these sparks of Kedusha that got scattered throughout the world. So now we have no choice but to actually go to these countries and we live there. And by us doing our Avoida in these various countries, we are able to attract the sparks of Kedusha. In fact, says um, Rav Gedal Yashor, this explains a very unusual phenomenon that Kali Yisrael have experienced throughout the Golas. Namely, we could be in a country, let's say Spain, and we could be there for hundreds of years, and we could reach the highest echelons of society. And we could be officers, advisors, finance ministers, and overnight, all of a sudden the government changes, and they throw us out, and they send us packing, and overnight, there's not even one Jew left in the whole country. And it, they turn on us like a dime. And you know how many countries this has happened in? Just every country we've ever lived in. But, right? Now, obviously, America is going to be different, right? Because just because this has happened in every single country we've ever been in, that doesn't have any bearing. That's not a reason to assume that will happen in America also, right? Why? It's very logical to say that America will be different than every single other Jewish experience. I mean, I think we should all feel very comfortable over here and completely ignore the pattern of Jewish history for the last 2,000 years. I mean, you know, it's just reasonable to assume that things will be different over here because here in America, they love us and they think we're adorable and they want us to be here forever and ever and there's no reason to assume that America will follow the pattern of every other Jewish experience. <coughs> anyway, but that's the phenomenon of the Gullus. By, by the way, yeah. In the, in the United States, we were thrown out one for one day for one of the states in the United States. Oh, that's right. Okay. That's um. I don't remember which state, but this was for one day. The next date was recited. If I'm not mistaken, that was uh, issued by Ulysses S. Grant um, during the uh, Civil War, where we were. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but yeah. this is what I know. For I have a book on it. I'll show you a very, a very important book. Yeah. So it's it's happened here as well. So I think Ulysses S. Grant. Be it as it may. Um, why is that? The answer is very simple. We have a specific task in the Gullahs, and that is to relinquish and to free up and to restore and bring back all the sparks of Kedusha that have ended up in, this con- in, a, in, a, in a country. Once we're finished doing our business, once we've done our job, once we've gathered all the sparks of Kedusha, then our business is finished. We have nothing left to do. We have, nothing, no, we have no more reason to be in that area. So overnight, God stirs up the heart of the government, and they get in their head, we got to go, and we leave, and we're off to the next. We're on to new business. We, we have, uh, there's no unfinished business. So in other words, that's the idea of the Gullahs. We have a specific task to accomplish. Once that task is complete, then overnight, we're out of here. 
In fact, the Chassam Soifer writes about this in no less than at least six places. This is a very prominent theme in the writings of the Chassam Soifer. This is something that he quotes from his Rebbe, Rav Nassim Adler. Rav Nassim HaKoyin Adler, who was uh, born in 1741. He lived till the year 1800. He was the Rebbe of the Chassam Soifer. And by the way, Rebbe, he, he, was, uh, he had very strict views regarding a number of matters, including kashrus, and because of that it caused a lot of friction between Rav Nassim Adler and the Frankfurt community, and they forced him out. Can you imagine? Rav Nassim Adler, one of the all-time great Achroinim, Rebbe of Sam Soifer, he was forced out of Frankfurt com- community. Um, he was a great Makubal, and the uh, Sam Soifer says that he heard from his Rebbe on the Pasuk, Me Hashem Mitzade Gaver, from the Lord are the footsteps of man, Kainanu, Vidarka Yechbatz. He says, I have a tradition from Hagoin HaChosid, from Nosan Adler, Kain Sadek. You know, why is it sometimes Hashem leads a Tzadik to go to some far Darbana place? Did ever happen? Sometimes you're driving and you get lost and you get out at a service station, and, you know, why did that have to happen? You know, I had my GPS, and I lost service for a second, I made a wrong turn. No, God sometimes orchestrates that people, tzaddikim, have to go to certain places, they have to pass by a certain tree, or a certain mountain, because there's a spark of Kedusha there, and you need to reel it in. So Hashem will make someone get lost, make somebody take a wrong turn, make somebody go to some forsaken, forlorn place. Otherwise, why would God want 20 Jews to go to Turkey? What's doing in Turkey? Okay, they're kvarim of tzaddikim. But you never know. There could be some kind of spark of kedusha there. And you need to bring it back. And you need to retrieve it. And that's the concept of Me Hashem Mitzade Gaver Kainanu Vedarkai Yechbatz. This is a great principle in Jewish thought that the footsteps of man are orchestrated by God because we never know what kind of nitzaitzas of Kedusha we need to hone in. And this idea the Chassam Soifer quotes from his other Rebbe, Reb Pinchas Horowitz, um, the Hafla, and the Hafla writes about this in many, many places, where the Hafla writes in this week's Parsha that Hashem tells Moshe, one more nega, afterwards God will send you out. When He sends you out, he will send you out absolutely. And the Hafla says that when Kalah Yisrael left Mitzrayim, all the Kedusha that was in Mitzrayim left. And therefore, um, Kalah Yisrael were told, you ain't ever going back there again because they, have, they finished all business in Egypt. They took out everything. That's why when the Mitzrayim were running after them, B'nai Yisrael were very surprised. Why are they uh, running after us? We thought we've depleted them of all Kedusha. So that's why God says that when the Egyptians coming, run, come running after you, this time, they will, then it will be a complete and absolute sending forth and there will be nothing left. The word achare, achare implies um, in a while, not immediately after. In other words, at the Yam is when Kalah Yisrael took out all the final sparks of Kedusha. Now, how did all this Kedusha get to Mitzrayim? How did it get there? The UPS, FedEx, DHL, how did the sparks of Kedusha get to Mitzrayim? The answer is, says the Hafla, these sparks of Kedusha fell there by the sin of the Eitz Hadas. As Avraham Avinu recognized when he said the words, Bama'ida! Eida is a lashon of Eitz Hadas. So Hashem said, Yodoya Teida. And finally, B'nai Yisrael were able to deplete the Mitzrayim of all of their Kedusha. And they went out, Berechush Gadol, the Gematria of Rechush Gadol, plus the 70 souls that went down to Mitzrayim is Gematria Eitz Hadas. Eitz Hadas, Eitz Hadas, is Gematria, Rechush Gadol, plus the Ayin Nefashais, who went down to Mitzrayim. And 
the Panam Yafei says further that the Iker Bizas Mitzrayim was not the gold and the silver and the money, but to uh, take out the spoils of Kedusha that fell into Mitzrayim, especially in their clothing. Like Rashi says that the clothing of the Mitzrayim was the most uh, endeared item because that actually, says the Hafla, contained the most Kedusha. And with this idea, Rav Gedal Yeshor explains the phenomenon that Paro, after a while, got fed up and he says, you know what, the Jewish people have too much time on their hands. They don't have to gather their own straw to make bricks. From now on, I won't provide the straw anymore. From now on, they're going to go gather their own straw to make the bricks. Now, we know from Paro's vantage point, the reason why he said that was uh, he wanted to work the Bnei Israel harder. But from the vantage point of Hashkach HaPratis, what the Rebbein Shalom was getting at, is that he wanted to expedite the Geula. And the reason why it was taking long is because the Bnei Yisrael still had to collect more sparks of Kedusha. So what, the Bnei, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu orchestrated was instead of Paroi providing the straw for the Bnei Yisrael, now the Bnei Yisrael scattered about all of Egypt. And by doing so, to gather the straw, they were able to expedite the gathering of all the sparks of Kedusha and Mimela. They were able to expedite their release from Mitzrayim. Says the holy Chassam Soifer, quoting his Rebbe, the Hafla, Rebbe Pinchas Horowitz, now we understand much of the exchange between Moshe and um, Parai. The Torah as Moshe, the Chassam Soifer, quotes the Arizal, that why did Yosef collect all the money in Mitzrayim? Because in the money were sparks of Kedusha that Yosef assisted and helped and facilitated the removal of these sparks of Kedusha. As the Pasuk says, Yatsu called Tziva Hashem Eretz Mitzrayim. And that's Makas Choyshech, because the light is produced from the uh, sources of Kedusha, but as the Bnei Yisrael are gathering and removing all of the Kedusha Mitzrayim, it was dark for Mitzrayim, and light for Bnei Yisrael. Now, Why is Moshe busy looking at Parai? Moshe is busy looking at Parai. Because even though it's usher to look at a Russia, but if someone who's a Tzaddik Amor can look at the Russia, and as we mentioned, the Russia has Kedusha in him, otherwise the Russia would not exist, the Russia would disintegrate, he would seek to cease to exist. Moshe had the capability of gazing at Parai and extracting from Parai these sparks of Kedusha that were in Parai. Until, until, until he was able to suck every last ounce of Kedusha out of Paroi, and there would be nothing left. So Paroi says to Moshe, Hey Moshe, I don't want you ever looking at me again! And Moshe says to Paroi, Exactly, you're right. Cain di Barta, you're right. You've been depleted. There's no more Kedusha in you. You're about to disintegrate. Says Rashi. You're saying good. Good gezakt. You said it at the right time. You're basically emptied out. I don't never have to look at you again. I'm only allowed to look at you even though you're not allowed to typically look at a Russia because I have the ability to extract your Kedusha. But once I'm able to... Uh, once I've finished with you and I have nothing left to look at you anymore, I'm never going to look at you again. And this is expounded upon in the Sefer, Chassam Sefer HaChadashos. And this is the phenomenon, by the way, of tzaddikim looking at someone and they turn into a pile of bones. Because basically, when the tzaddik looks at someone, he's able to extract his kedusha. Once that person has no kedusha anymore, they cease to exist as an entity. It says Chassam Soifer, in Chassam Soifer Chadashos, let's just take a look here, he says, Vayoymer Moshe, Kein dibarta, loyoysef oid roois panecha. Rashi says, Yofe dibarta, vizmanoi dibarta. says Chassam Soifer, this could be explained based on a small chakira, but it's precious. The truth is, it's also to look at a Russia. And really, Moshe should not have looked at Paroi at all, at all. Says Chassam Soifer, even though 
looking at a rasha contaminates the heart because it causes some association with the rasha. That's not always the case. Great tzaddikim, that the light of their neshama is so powerful. Their soul is like a raging flame, is like a great fire. They could gaze through histaklus to remove all the kedusha that was in a certain Russia. By the way, it's the same thing. There were, you know, great rabbanim in uh, Europe, the Malbim, the Pnei Yeshua, the Shagas Aryeh. They would stay in one city, and after a short while, they would have to go on to another city. And then after another short while, they moved on. Why? It's the same phenomenon. They finished their business. They were able to extract whatever they needed to, and then they moved on. So, the, the Chassam Sofer explains this as the phenomenon of the Eish Shal Havesya, the fire of God. The soul is a great fire. What happens when a small flame comes into contact with a great fire? The small flame jumps into the great fire. When a great tzaddik encounters a rasha, the little bit of kedusha that exists in the rasha is then removed and is attracted to the great fire, and the rasha will cease to exist because his kaiach kedusha has been removed from him. Says the Chassam Soifer. He says, "Vehu kiner Hashem nishmas adam v'chasher nira b'poyal hatachtoinim shem yaver tavera hagdoila." If there's a great fire. And you put a small flame next to it. Then the flame of the fire will be drawn to the great fire. And the small flame and the small flame will be drawn to the great fire. And it will be attached to it and it will become one. That's human nature. Leo's davar katan that a small thing should be nimshach, nitzmad v'neegda mechuber la davar gadol b'tevai. Or a small thing will attach to a much larger thing. And the same way this exists in the physical world, this exists in the spiritual world. Same thing with neshamais that the light of a great tzaddik, which is a great neshama, could draw b'teva the ne- the neshama of a different adam and remove from him just by looking at him. This is what we find in Shas many times. The tzaddik looks at the even a smaller tzaddik, he removes his kedusha, and the person becomes a pile of bones. Says the Chsam Soifer, that even though you may think that this is a uh, small phenomenon, he says, I want you to know, the Hadavar Haza, this matter, Huchakiru Gdoila, is a great investigation. And even though it may be small in the eyes of those who do not acknowledge the sanctity of the righteous, but it is very great in the eyes of someone who has a Nayim to see. This is what it means, Marvar Aboisai, that Moshe tells. Para, you said good. You're saying good. I will never see you again. I have no reason to see you again. And he says, the last maka. there's no question, Jews, people have already removed almost everything, almost all of the Kedusha. And therefore they're commanded, don't ever look at them again. You have no business looking at them again. You've already fulfilled and you've already accomplished everything you need to. In fact, the Torah says by Yitzchak that when Yitzchak became old, his eyes dimmed from seeing, so he called Esav. Meaning, because because his eyes dimmed, he was not able to see who Esav was. But in the end, um, he... Before he gave the brachas, he says, Geshana u'shekali, that he was able to be mizdabek aidei neshicha and aidei reach. And all of these uh, expressions are, are a mashal to uh, spiritual forces. Now, Rabbi Yonis and Ibishit says the same idea 
of how tzaddikim could look at a rasha and they become gal shalat samois. And he, expl- he explains, based on this phenomenon, the idea that Yaakov would look at Esav. You know, Yaakov t- tells Esav, Ah! Oh, Kira'ois panecha, kira'ois pinea loikim. Looking at you is like looking at God. How is looking at Esav like looking at God? What, what is that supposed to mean? How is looking at Esav similar to uh, looking at a Kaddish Baruch Hu? The answer is, says Rabbi Anasin Ibishitz, that the same way looking at God is an experience of, of assimilating Kedusha, so too when Yaakov would look at Esav, he would remove from Esav whatever Kedusha was, uh, existed in Esav. This is what it means that, es- that Yitzchak loved Esav, ki tzayid b'fiv. Tzayid b'fiv means there was Kedusha in the mouth of Esav. There were sparks of Kedusha in Esav. And Yitzchak was margish this. By the way, says uh, Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz, that's the reason why Esav's head was buried in the Ma'aras HaMachpelah. Because although he was a Rasha, but he had these sparks of Kedusha that lay dormant in his piv, in his head. And therefore, Moshe tells Paroi, he says, you're right, I will never see you again. Um, Yafe di Barta, Uvizmano di Barta. Says the Chsam Soifer in Parshas Vayishlach, number 21 on your sheet. That's why before Yaakov encounters Esav, Yaakov's worried maybe Esav doesn't have any more Kedusha left in his face. So Yaakov makes sure to send Esav money. This way, because the money of Tzadikim have Kedusha in it, he'll be able, if Esav lost all Kedusha, then at least Yaakov will say, I'll inject a little bit more Kedusha into him. This way I'll be able, that will justify my looking at Esav again. By the way, the Chassam Soifer uses this to explain the plan of Bilam Harasha. In Parshas Balak, Bilam tells Balak, L'cha i'atzcha ma'yasa amazah la'amcha ba'achris hayamim. Bilam tells uh, Balak, let me tell you what's going to happen in the end of days. And Chazal say that he gave him the Eitzah that he should get the B'nai Ismayev to be Mazana with Kal Yisrael. Where do Chazal see in the wor- words that I will let you know what's going on in the end of days that, Bila, that Bal- um, Bilam is advising Balak that he should get Kal Yisrael to be Mazana? So Chassam Sefer explains as follows, that Bilam was telling Balak, look, there is no question that one day God will take these people and bring them to the land of Israel, and there will be His people, and there will be an era of Achros Hayamim, and there will be an era of unbridled blessing and success, and that's a foregone conclusion. So we cannot stop that, all we could do is delay that. And you know how we could delay that? Says Bilam, look, the job of these people is merely, the job of these people is, they have to collect sparks of Kedusha. They've almost completely depleted us. But I have a way to stall the process. If I get our people, if we get your women to be Mazana with them, then that will cause so many more sparks of Kedusha to enter our people that it will delay their process endlessly. It will inject in them so much, so much Kedusha that you know, they'll never be able to... Uh, to it, will be, it will be endless. It will be really endless. And in other words, we, this will be able to delay the process of Klai so gathering the Kedusha from Mayav for much, much longer. This was the Eitzah that Bilam gave um, Balak. And the Chassam Soifer says that this is uh, the reason why Klai Yisrael took the money out of Mitzrayim and why Yaakov Avinu sent Esav these, uh, these added gifts. Now, amazing Arachayim HaKadosh. Let me see if we can get it over, up over here. Says Arachayim HaKadosh. You know, he says, 
why in Shas does it say Yahiv Be'ene He placed his eye on him and he killed him. But don't Chazal say Toiv Ayin Hu Yivarch, the eye of the tzaddik only bl- brings blessing. And again, he explains this phenomenon that when the tzaddik looks at the rasha, he's able to suck out whatever little kedusha the rasha has. Says the Archaim Hakadosh, that is the exact same method and mode that Hakadosh Baruch Hu did by Makas Bacharas. You ever realize by Makas Bacharas it says, "V'avarti biyaretz mitzam belayla who." I will pass through the land of Egypt and I will smite every firstborn. Does one have to do with the other? Does the fact that God is passing through Mitzrayim, is that the reason why He's smiting all the firstborn? Are they connected to each other? And in fact, our Chaim HaKadr says, yeah, exactly what we find in Shas, when the Tzaddik looks at the Rosh, and by doing so he sucks out his Kedusha, by God being present that night in the land of Egypt, the, the overwhelming power of the sanctity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence, that great fire, that great conflagration, it sucked up every little spark and every flickering candle of the Mitzrim, and it just snuffed out all their souls. The same way Reb Sheshes looks at somebody, he's able to pull out their Kedusha and they become Gal Shalat Samois. Well, that is exactly what the Rebbe Nishlam did the night of Mitzrayim. This is, says Archaim HaKadosh, what it means that Asid HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lishchait Es Malach HaMavis. The Gemara in Sukkah says, and Afnan Beis, La'asud lavoi, Hashem will bring the Samach men and Shechtim. Really? What kind of Shechita? Chesidosh is Shechita. Shechitas Bet Yosef. What kind of Shechita will God Shecht the Malach HaMavas? What's the process? What's the procedure? The answer is, there will be such a revelation of Kedusha that the whatever spark of Kedusha is in the Samach Mem will be drawn out, will be snuffed out, and the Malchamavas will cease to exist, similar to the night of Makas Bechayros. V'yavarti b'yaretz Mitzrayim b'layla azeh, v'hikesi kol b'char. And the Chesam Soifer, in the Drosha's Chesam Soifer, explains, based on the approach of his Rebbe, the Hafla, that Klal Yisrael didn't understand why, by Makas Bechayros, by Kriyas Yamsuf, the Mitzrayim were still running after them. Klai so figured, uh, we thought we're done with these people. We thought we've uh, removed every last vestige of Kedusha in the Mitzrim. And Moshe said, no, you haven't finished yet. There's still a little bit more to go. And by Kriyas Yamsuf, you'll get it all out. This is the deeper meaning of Toirei Zahav Na'as Alach Im Nekudais HaKosef which Gadol Hoysa Yoyser Bizas Hayam Yoyser Mi Bizas Mitzrayim Whatever sparks of Kedusha the Jewish people took out from the Yam were much greater and of greater magnitude than when we left Mitzrayim. By the way, now that today is Rosh Chodesh Shvat, and Rosh Chodesh Shvat is 30 days before Rosh Chodesh Adar, so we're ready, Shloy Shem Yom Kaidam Adar! You know what that means? We have to start talking about Purim. And Esther invites Mordechai to the party. And the Gemara even asks, you know, Ma Ra Esther Lahazman es Haman. Why did Esther invite Haman to the party? And the Gemara gives many, many perushim. But Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Bardichov, he's bothered by the expression, Vayet say Haman bayoimahu someach v'toiv leiv. Haman was toiv leiv. Toiv leiv. Toiv leiv is a very high madrega. By Boyaz it says. That vayet vayitav liboy, he vayoycha vayet vayitav liboy b'divrei Torah. That toiv leiv is a very high madrega. Haman was on a high madrega. Toiv leiv. The answer is, this is what Esther's plan was. Esther knew that Haman, if he's alive, he has a spark of kedusha. By the way, we know he had a spark of kedusha. His bnei ban of shal Haman learned in Torah of Nebrak. Esther's plan was, if I make for Haman, Sudas Tzadikim. So that little bit of Kedusha in Haman will be attracted to the great Kedusha Mai Suda. So I'll pull away his entity from his source of Tumah. So now he's dislocated from Tumah, but he won't 
I'll make sure that he doesn't come all the way to my side of Kedusha, and then he'll be completely destroyed. So these are tactics that Sadiqim have used from time immemorial. This is the uh, job of the Tzadikim from the Chayra, the Eitz Hadas. This is how Hashem performed Makas B'chayrois of the Avarti, when the presence of God is in Mitzrayim, it snuffs out all the Kedusha Mitzrayim, all the B'chayrim die. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu tells Parai, you're right, I'm never going to look at you again. I've been looking at you at till now, I've been drawing out your Kedusha. But now there's nothing left. Yofed Dibarta, Ubizmanoi Dibarta. Hashem utilized the principle of Yahiv by Enoi Venasa Gaon Shalat Samais. Says Arachai Makadosh, two Chidushim Noiroim, that it was worthwhile to stick out this shear just to hear. It was worthwhile to come down to this world just to be Zaychet to hear this. Says Arachai Makadosh. Now we understand why God waited till the last second to take us out of Mitzrayim. Why do we have to be in Mitzrayim? We have to yank out all the sparks of Kedusha. Where are there sparks of Kedusha? There are sparks of Kedusha everywhere. Is there Kedusha in Paroi? Yes. Moshe took it out. Is there Kedusha in Mitzrayim? Yes. Is there Kedusha in Tuma? Absolutely. Now in every Madrega of Tuma, there's Kedusha. There's Madrega in the first Shar of Tuma, in the second Shar of Tuma, in the 40th Shar, in the 41st Shar, in the 42nd Shar. So God had to leave us in Mitzrayim until the very, 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 very end. Because if He would have taken us out two weeks early, then we would have only taken out the Kedusha in the 46th level of Tumah, in the 47th level of Tumah, in the 48th level of Tumah. But we never would have yanked out the Kedusha in the 49th level of Tumah. And then we would have unfinished business and we'd be going with those Hasidim back to Egypt every Parshas Va'era. So therefore... God said, I want you to do you, I'm going to do you a favor. Because when you leave Mitzrayim now, you ain't ever going back there. So I'm going to leave you in Mitzrayim until the very last second so that you could yank out the spark of Kedusha on the lowest level of Tumah. And then I'm going to get you out just in the split second. So, Frekt Arachayim HaKadosh Akasha. Then God should have lived, lived, uh, left us there even longer. Because does the Shar Nun have a spark of Kedusha? Yeah. Otherwise it couldn't exist. So why didn't God leave us in Mitzrayim until we went down to the Shar Nun so that we could yank out the, sh- the Nitzvah of Kedusha and the Shar Nun? Says Arachayim HaKadosh, because the Shar Nun is the point of no return. So you're right, there's a spark of Kedusha there. But nobody ever made it out alive. You can't go down into the spark, uh, into the... Nun Shari Tuma and yank anything out because he ain't coming out of there. That's the point of no return. So therefore God allowed us to sink lower and lower and lower and lower in order to extract every last ounce of Tuma, uh, Kedusha. Now we understand more of Rabbi Sai, the times we're living in. Sometimes you wonder, Ma Asa like him on why do we have to live in such a degenerate, backward, corrupt, immoral, indecent, promiscuous, deviant society where there is no morality at all, where black is white and white is black? It's worse than Sodom, it's worse than Mitzrayim. The answer is because obviously we have unfinished business that whatever we didn't do in Mitzrayim, we got to do now in America. And when Jewish people uphold the eternal values of the Torah, surrounded by the most indecent, deviant practices in society, we're going to yank out all those last sparks of Kedusha that nobody ever had access to. And now the Archaim HaKadosh says the Kedusha of the century. The truth is, you could go into the Shar Nun and pull out Kedusha. You know why in Mitzrayim they couldn't go down into the Shar Nun? Because they didn't have the Torah. And if you don't have the Torah, you don't have the opposing force of Kedusha to yank anything out of the Shar Nun. But once HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the Torah to Klal Yisrael, then the world could plummet even to lower than Mem Tashari Tuma, and you could still survive to tell the tale. And that's what we're seeing today. So the truth is, Ashrenu ma toiv chalkenu 
Umayafa Yerusha Seinu. What a zechus we have to live in the most deviant, degenerate times the world has ever known. Why? Because there's still a few sparks. When a Jew lives their life, the Kedusha Tahara, learning Torah Lashma, davening B'Tahara, doing the mitzvahs Kesikunan, surrounded by worse than Mem Tashari Tuma, I guarantee you it's worse than Mem Tashari Tuma. We're already well beyond the Sharnun. But the Archaim HaKadosh prophetically says that in the end of days, the world will fall beyond the Sharnun. And it has to, Rabbi Isai. Because otherwise, what are we doing here? It is our Avoida to maintain our Kedusha, even on the, surrounded by the lowest Madregos. And then we'll be able to yank out the final la- last sparks, and once we do that, overnight, Hashem will do us a big favor. They'll say, you know what? We don't really want you here anymore. Get out of here. Go to your homeland. And hopefully then we'll be able to uh, return back to where we belong. Berina, that's Hashem. It should be Bekarov, Amenu, Amen. Thanks everyone for listening. Have a terrific day. Baruch Tia. Have a good day, everyone. Call Tov. Call Tov. Bye bye. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.